Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Reuter. Dr. Reuter's been a mentor of mine for the longest time, and, and uh, back in the day, was one of the people that got me interested in cardiothoracic surgery. I also want to thank Dr. Ramchandani and uh, Dr. Fontana and guests for the opportunity to present this morning. Uh, my talk is going to be uh, a TAVR overview. This is my disclosure side, slide. Uh, and in the spirit of re-evolution, I'm going to talk about TAVR overview, but the underlying theme will be uh, the importance of surgeons staying relevant. June 29, 2007, this is an important date. Uh, how many guys can remember what happened on this date, June 29, 2007? And I'm sure it probably impacted everybody in this room. On June 29, 2007, Steve Jobs walked into the Moscone Center in San Francisco, and he announced a collaboration he had with Singular Wireless and Apple. And the project was called Project Purple. And as he walked onto the stage, these were, were his first words. Today, Apple's going to reinvent the phone. And before then, this is what we had. It was a simple, bulky, really didn't do much. These were the phones that we've had, and many of you probably recognize this phone. And this is what we have now, and progress really is a beautiful thing. We do almost everything with our phone. This happened in 2007, and also coincides with the partner trial, the beginning of the partner trial. So as it's been exciting from 2007 till now to see the progression of how tele, tele, cell phone technology has evolved, it's been really exciting for me as a young surgeon to see the progression and uh, evolution of uh, cardiothoracic surgery. This is how we do uh, cardiothoracic, cardiothoracic surgery in the past, and this is how we're going to do it in the present and the future. And if you look carefully, uh, it's subtle, but the patient on the far left has his eyes open because increasingly we're doing TAVR patients with patients uh, under conscious sedation. So that's going to be the future. So let's talk a little bit more about the explosion and the people accredited uh, to the explosion. A lot of people think it's Alain Cribier, but it actually really started with Dr. Anderson in Denmark. Around the late 1980s uh, was uh, when coronary stents started coming into the field. And Dr. Anderson thought, well, hey, if you can put a coronary stent inside a coronary artery, well, we could probably do this inside an aortic valve. So he bought a, a bunch of pig hearts, uh, sewed the leaflets into a metal frame that he built, crimped it, put it into pigs, and it worked. And he did again, it worked, and did again, it worked. He did about 40 animals, and it worked. He created a patent, and he tried to get folks to try to buy the patent. Absolutely no one was interested. So he went back to the bench. Around the same time, Alain Cribier thought, hey, we could probably do this as well. And try to, try to get some funding for it, wasn't able to get any funding at all. Uh, he partnered up with Martin Leone and created a company called PVT, and they were to raise enough money to develop some prototypes. And then fortunately, a patient came in, a really sick patient, with an EF about 15%, severe aortic stenosis, at the cusp of death. They implanted this valve in the patient, and the patient completely turned around. So France uh, approved uh, this device as a safety trial for a limited number of patients, and it did very well. And then Edwards bought the device for approximately, not that bad, $125 million. It's a steal for what it's worth uh, today. So the, this really began, began the explosion. And to, re, to go back to the, uh, uh, to the iPhone analogy, um, Dr. Alain Cribier on that day really reinvented how we approach tran transcatheter uh, aortic valve replacement as well as aortic valve disease. This is a picture of him with this patient, April 16, 2002, uh, drinking uh, a glass of champagne while the patient's in the ICU. Since then, it's been an explosion. So I did a very quick PubMed search, uh, Tavern Publications 2007 until now, and as you see in 2011, uh, it's been an exponential rise in publications. These were, were the first initial Tavern sites, uh, 26 investigator sites uh, across the, uh, the country. These are the Partner 2 sites. These are the Corval sites. And now these are the sites, some of the sites we have in 2014. This is the past. This is the present and future, and it's continuing, continuing to grow. These are some notable figures that, has, that have uh, transcatheter valves implanted. Uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, Peter Singer, I suspect in the future we're going to have more and more folks with transcatheter aortic valves. So what does the data show? I wanted to talk about a couple of really pivotal trials out there that really put TAVRs on the map. The first one was the New England Journal of Medicine paper in 2010. And these were patients who were inoperable. So as surgeons, we would not operate on these patients at all. So the standard of care at that time is medical therapy. What was unique is they took these group of patients, randomized them to either transcatheter valve or standard of care. And what we saw was a 24, 25% survival benefit. And there are very few things in medicine that we can do that offers a 25% survival benefit. The mean gradient was sustained over time at two years, 10 millimeters of mercury. And overall, overall quality of life was improved over uh, standard therapy. 
But the, the downside was there's a high stroke rate. At one year, uh, the uh, transcatheter valve had a 7.3% uh, stroke rate, and at two years, 13.8%. So clearly not ready for prime time. Major vascular complications, 16.8% compared to standard therapy, which is essentially nothing. So then came the, the next trial. These are patients who are high risk. These are patients that we would operate on, but we deem them high risk. And in this trial, they randomized patients either TAVR or surgical aortic valve replacement. For the TAVR, they're either TF or TA. It was, uh, this was designed as a non-inferiority study. And essentially, all-cause mortality at one and two years was essentially not different. Stroke, well, stroke is still Achilles' heel. Stroke for TAVR is a little higher, 7.5% compared to 4.4% for the surgical aortic valve replacement. Major vascular complications, still another big issue, 11% uh, for the transcatheter valve, and in the aortic valve replacement, only 3.8%. Major bleeding, well, obviously, it's a surgical aortic valve replacement, so you have uh, uh, more of a transfusion requirement, 23% uh, for the AVR, 10% for the transcatheter valve. Moderate to severe PVL at 30 days, uh, TAVR 12.2%, SAVR 0.9%. But after all this, it was encouraging enough that the FDA approved transcatheter valves in uh, November uh, 2nd, 2011, and really put transcatheter valves on, on the map. But that said, you know, transcatheter valve probably really isn't ready for prime time just yet. Let's compare the data. So stroke data, partner trial, 7.3%, surgical AVR, 4.4%. Vascular complications, almost 17%. Surgical AVR, about 4%. Paravivor leak, 12.2%. Most surgeons probably won't walk out of the OR if a patient had more, uh, more than mild uh, uh, paravivor leak. SAVR, 0.9%. Durability, huge question mark at that time. And we know for our surgical aortic valves, we have 10 to 15 years of durability. But the problem with this line of thought is that as surgeons, and Dr. Reardon and I talk about this all the time, it's so important for us to really be proactive, embrace technology, and try to lead to the technology. So for the transcatheter valve, not sit in the corner and watch other people do it, be at the front table doing it, but not only that, be at the podium and try to lead trials as Dr. Reardon does across the country. So be surgeon leaders, that's the only way we're gonna be relevant because otherwise we're gonna miss a boat. So again, it's important for us to stay relevant uh, during this process. In a very quick amount of time, the Edwards valve has gone through four generations of valve. Uh, started, started off with the Kribbe Edwards valve, the Sapien valve, XT, and now the most recent valve that uh, Edwards has is the S3. For the Medtronic platform, uh, initially started with the core valve, and then now is the Evolute R uh, valve. So uh, let's talk a little about the most recent valve that Edwards has, uh, which is the S3. And the question is whether or not the S3 really addressed some of these Achilles heel, uh, the Achilles heel that, uh, uh, that, uh, that TAVR has. This is a partner two trial in patients who are high risk with severe aortic stenosis. Uh, this is a picture of the valve uh, in, uh, in its uh, purest form. Um, these are the sites for the S3 trial. Uh, again, there's a high-risk patients uh, with S3 uh, valves implanted. 583 patients, 13 deaths, a total of 570 patients. Uh, three patients were lost to follow-up. What's really impressive is 99% follow-up, 99.5% follow-up. There are a few trials out there that we have that have such a high follow-up rate, so that's very impressive. Uh, to have such a high follow-up rate. Average STS score, these are high-risk patients, 8.6%. Average age, 82. Uh, most common platform was transfemoral, 84%. And the most common valves implanted was 20, were 23 and 26 millimeter valves. About 90% of the patients had class three or four heart failure symptoms, and about 30% of the patients uh, were frail. This is really impressive. All-cause mortality, 1.6%. Cardiovascular, cardiovascular mortality, 1.0%. All stroke, 1.4%. Disabling stroke, 0.8%. This is the evolution of mortality uh, at 30 days for the various partner trials. And as you can see, the trend continues to go down and down and down. With the original trial, mortality was roughly 6.3%. And, and more recently, in the S3 high-risk trial, it was 1.6%. Looking at strokes, again, strokes started off high, 7.3%, and more recently uh, in the S3 uh, trial, uh, stroke was 1.4%. Major vascular complications, 5.3%. Mean gradient overall, baseline gradient uh, roughly 45, baseline mean gradient 45, at 30 days it was maintained at 11, and subsequent days has shown that it continues to be maintained and has not shown uh, much evidence of valve deterioration. Next question, paravivor leak. 
2.5% of patients have either uh, mild or uh, none or mild paraviral leak. The rest are moderate or severe. So a very, very small percent of patients now with paraviral leak with, uh, with the, uh, the S3 valve. Definitive outcomes, 491 patients, 1.6 all-cause mortality, 0.8% disabling stroke. What about, uh, the next question is durability. This is a five-year outcome from the original uh, partner trial uh, that was presented by Dr. Michael Mack. Uh, going up to five years, there's really no evidence at all of change in mean gradient uh, at five years. And uh, in his paper uh, and in the findings, uh, he writes, we recorded no structural valve deterioration requiring surgical valve replacement in either group. Very impressive for five years so far. There is some anecdotal data that at nine years, the valve has maintained its durability. This is actually the original uh, um, uh, Cribier valve that, uh, that uh, John Webb uh, uh, from Vancouver uh, presented. So let's go back to the Keyless Heels uh, picture. Stroke originally partner 7.3, S3 trial 1.4%, vascular complications 16.8%, with the S3 valve 5.3%, uh, perivalvular leak 12.2%, uh, S3 2.5%, durability. Uh, initially a question mark, but it looks like we have some reasonable five-year data with the XT valve and some anecdotal nine-year data. As time will tell. Uh, what's interesting is as surgeons, you know, we go around and we tell our patients, well, we have, we put a valve in, we have 10 to 15 year, 10 to 15 year durability. The, the reality is very few of the valves that we actually put in right now have 10 to 15 year durability. If you're putting in a trifecta valve, you're putting in a magna valve, those valves don't have 10 to 15 year du durability. We use those numbers based off a handful, one or two handful of studies out there that has shown that. So uh, the FDA ha has uh, uh, pushed the transcatheter valve to a slightly different standard, and we always go back to durability, but please keep in mind that a lot of the surgical valves we have right now don't have uh, objective 10 to 15 year durability. So what about low risk? That's around the corner as well. High risk patients, this piece of pie here really divides patients who have severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, high risk, intermediate risk, and low risk. So high risk, we know it's FDA approved right now, uh, supported by these various trials. Intermediate risk, there has been ongoing trials. This will be presented at the upcoming ACC, and so far the data looks, uh, it looks encouraging. And low risk, this is uh, a trial that starts next month. Uh, we're uh, one of the sites uh, for it. I know Medtronic also has a low risk trial as well. Uh, this trial, patients are going to be followed uh, for 10 years, and patients are going to be randomized either TAVR or surgical aortic valve replacement. Uh, the requirements for this trial, an STS score of less than 4% uh, deemed by a surgeon. Again, a one-on-one -on -one random randomization, uh, TAVR versus SAVR. And again, 10-year uh, follow-up for these uh, patients. 2014 was a really golden year for transcatheter valve. Uh, when the, with the release of the ACC AHA guidelines, for the first time, TAVR entered the guidelines. Uh, it's a class one recommendation for patients not suitable for AVR, and a class two A recommendation for patients um, who are high risk uh, surgical patients. Another important concept too that was entered in the guidelines as a class one recommendation is the concept of a heart valve team and the importance of discussing complex uh, valve patients with cardiologists there, with surgeons there, with anesthesiologists there as well. So again, this is part of the ACC AHA guidelines for 2014. In the future, well, the future looks uh, fairly exciting. Here are some of the things that may or may not happen. Uh, there might be a role for patients in intermediate risk. We'll find out uh, in, uh, at the ACC. Uh, patients who are low risk, the P3 trial uh, will help answer that, and as well as the Medtronic uh, trial that Dr. Reardon is a PI for. Valve and valve, um, Dr. Deeb is going to talk about that in, in uh, our uh, next presentation. Conscious sedation, uh, most of our patients are, are being done under conscious sedation now. A good handful of our patients are uh, getting towers without preoperative CT scan, and these are the patients that have uh, high creatinine on dialysis, uh, not necessarily on dialysis, but high creatinine, and we don't want to tip them to dialysis, and we can get away sometimes with just doing transesophageal echo. Shorter length of stay, well, it's not uncommon to send a patient home on post-up day one, but there are some centers out there that they're sending patients home on post-up day zero, and that's a potential as well. Increased durability, smaller delivery system, you know, conceivably, if you can do a TAVR without uh, TE imaging and if the te technology improves, there's a possibility you could do the uh, TAVR by the bedside. Uh, lower profile valves, aortic insufficiency, lower cost, and transcath uh, transcatheter mitral technology, which is uh, around the corner as well. Uh, there are three devices out there right now under trial, under feasibility trial. 
These are the approved uh, transcatheter valves in the United States. As you can see, we lag a little bit in Europe. These are all the commercially available uh, valves uh, in Europe and elsewhere. This is one of our patients, uh, one of our first patients we did under conscious sedation. This is post-op day one for him. He was ready to go home, uh, but because of billing and Medicare issues, we had to keep him a couple of days, but clearly he was ready to go home on post-op day number one. This is our transcatheter valve team, our heart valve team, uh, and uh, uh, this is a picture of our heart valve conference. Well, progress really is a beautiful thing, and within the past, uh, since 2007, we've seen uh, a, a progression in iPhone technology and smartphone technology. Uh, similarly, we've seen a lot of exciting changes in the way we approach patients with aortic valve disease. This is the past, this is the future, but the reality of the future is gonna be something like this. We're rarely doing transapical and transaortic procedures now, and they're almost all done transfemorally. I can't remember the last time we did a transapical or transaortic TAVR at our center. I wanted to uh, emphasize again, it's important for surgeons to stay relevant. And in closing, I have two slides to show. This is some data that, um, that we'll be presenting at the upcoming AATS. Uh, a study uh, from our group, uh, Emory, and, uh, and Dr. Lamelsa's group in, at Sinai. And what we looked at was total aortic valve replacement, um, and we try to break it down a little bit more. So from 2011 to 2014, uh, you see a growth uh, in SAVR, mini AVR, as well as transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So we broke it down a little bit and we looked at SAVR. So we saw a gradual increase in, uh, in SAVR. But in 2013, what we saw was an inflection point. And for a while, people were saying, well, SAVR's increasing, increasing, but some of us actually are feeling the inflection point where SAVR might be going down, and we are certainly seeing that at our respective centers. And then we looked at mini-AVR. Mini-AVR is on the up, and as you see, it crosses at late 2013. In 2013, there have been uh, uh, more mini-AVRs than standard surgical AVRs. As a little bit of perspective, in the United States, roughly 10% of surgical AVRs are done minimally invasively. In Europe, over 50 or 60% are done minimally invasively. Then we looked at TAVR, TAVR-TF. Well, TAVR-TF continues to grow and grow and grow, and I suspect that uh, that curve is continue, uh, gonna continue to head up to the right uh, top-hand corner. And then lastly, we looked at TA TAVR. And as you saw, we got an increase in TA TAVR, but in 2013, it's going down, and I suspect it's gonna continue to go down. So the, the particular point in this slide, I think, is that for us to stay relevant, uh, we obviously need to do, be able to do surgical aortic valve replacement, but we need to ride the up, up curve, which is TF TAVR as well as minimally, minimally invasive aortic valve replacement, and that's why most of you are here in this room. And when I talk about transcatheter uh, uh, TAVRs, I, I think it's really important for us to really embrace the technology be able to do it independently, as uh, Dr. Reardon and Dr. Uh, Deeb uh, had mentioned, without other cardiologists in the room, really be able to spearhead it in the room, but not only that, be able to lead the technology outside the operating room uh, during trials uh, and really push the field. So in conclusion, I think it's important for us to stay relevant and uh, for us to uh, not miss the boat. Thank you so much for your time.